This is part 10, which is the last one. In this final video I refit the inlet manifold, auxiliary drive belt, add oil, too little, and coolant. My wife starts the car and it passes its MOT. In the last video I replaced the four inlet seals, so carrying on from there I will now bolt the plastic outer intake manifold on. Use a 12mm socket to tighten the five bolts and torque them to 22 newton meters. I'm just going to make sure the surfaces are perfectly clean with some very fine wet and dry paper there so those new seals were definitely seal. And a little bit of light oil on here. Notice that actually two of them are actually studs with nuts. So there's actually only three bolts and two studs with two nuts. Now also note the pipe work here. We need to connect this pipe first and it goes underneath and also this other pipe will be connected later on. So make sure you note those two pipes because they are awkward and they're underneath this manifold. So presumably if the two studs had still stayed in place I could hook this onto the two studs. Um, but the two studs came out with the manifold. So I'm just connecting that pipe underneath. It is very awkward to get to. Just put a little bit of lubrication on there, trying to help the pipes go on. So you've got to tuck your hand underneath there and just push that little pipe back on. So if you look at part one of my series, you'll see that pipe very clearly. And don't forget to put the little clamp back on as well. Yeah, like I say, a bit of a devil to get to that. So I'm trying some other long reach pliers now. All right, so I think that's on. So we've now got this other pipe here. A little bit easier to get this one on. So there we are, and put the little clip back on. So we should be able to bring the manifold up now to the inner inlet manifold and put our fixtures back in. So I'll speed this part up. Yeah, so that's actually a stud with a nut on. Then a bolt, then a bolt, then another bolt, and then lastly a stud with a nut. So the centre one of these was quite rusty, so the head was kept slipping on that. Probably should have replaced that bolt. So spin these up, and then these are torqued to 22 newton meters. So there we are, set our torque wrench to that, 22. Like I say, the center one slipped. But the others were okay. We now need to put the intake manifold tuning valve back on. That's a 10 millimeter socket. So that has the single bolt here. So pop the IMT back on. And there's also a connector that will need to be connected back onto that. So we now need to reconnect the positive crankcase ventilation valve to the water pump housing. This is just a push fit. It's in an awkward position again, um, but with some long nose pliers you can sort of grab it and just push it back in. Like so. So now we can go back to the injector wiring harness on the right hand side now and start to bring that over. Now what you actually want to do is lay this wiring loom down first 
before connecting the pipe which has got the two green tape ends on. So I connected those first and then I had to pull it back off again to drop this pipe underneath. So push that wiring loom under now before you connect the the pipe with the two green ends. So that was the little pipe with the yellow end on, which goes to the valve. That was the valve I actually broke. I've mended that with some JB Weld. So I'm just removing the tape on this. Like I say, I am going to have to pull this back off again to get the injector wiring to feed underneath. Bit of a silly oversight there. So I'm just going to bring the fuel pipe down now as well. So tuck that underneath and then that just pushes onto the fuel rail. Like so. Yeah, I'm doing all this, and I've only got to just pull that back off again in a moment. Shame I didn't notice that. So I'm putting some of the connectors back onto the throttle body. There's the blue one. Just pop that on. There's a few connectors on there. So that's a white one there. And that is for the incoming air temperature. The sensor inside there. So we've also got that little pipe there that needs to go on with the white end. And that goes onto the throttle body. So I'm just removing the white tape. Making a bit of a hash of that. Right, so the white tape's off there now. Got a bit of debris there. Deary me. Right. Okay, so we can now connect this little pipe with the white ends. So it's getting the routing right on all this. Because you don't want things to be crisscrossing too much. Everything needs a nice, easy path. There we go, we've realised that the wiring loom should have been underneath that. So we'll pop that off, drop the wiring loom down. And that clips in there. And those push on. There's like a couple of tags there on the fuel rail itself. And that just pushes on and clips in. Alright, so we can put this pipe back on now. Like so. Alright then. So we've still got this little white pipe to deal with. But we're going to connect the injectors up. Note the earth wire there. Still hanging around. Mustn't forget to connect that earth wire in the middle of the cylinder head. 
So that's the wiring for the IMT valve. Just connected that. And there is a little bolt down here that holds part of the wiring loom. There's like a metal bracket on it. So I'm just going to pop that back on. I think that was 10 mil. Right, back to this little white pipe. Remove that tape. It's been dying to go back on. There we are. And then we can just push the wiring harness into these clips that's on the air intake tubing. Must not forget the all-important radiator coolant hose. So now for the coolant hose. Now, looking at those clips, they are actually quite rusty. Now, something I did realise later on was one of the clips down by the thermostat was actually really rusty and wasn't holding on properly. So in hindsight, it might be worth just changing some of these clips on the cooling system if it looks like they're heavily corroded. Because the last thing you want is a leak, a small leak, later on when everything's been put back together. Like I found um, once the engine was all finished, I had a slight leak and it turned out to be one of the hose clips um, in an awkward position by the thermostat. So it might be just worth thinking about that. Now the air filter assembly. Note it might be worth trying to pre-fit the air induct pipe at this point. Here is a photo of the pipe that may be worth fitting first. So like I just mentioned, it may be better to fit the air duct first prior to actually putting the air filter housing on. Because um, later on I think I had to remove the battery to try and get it back in there. But anyway, so... I started with this air filter first, so this is a 10 millimeter socket for this. You have one very long bolt on the right. So I'm going to speed this part up because it's only held on with, I think it's like three bolts, um, and it's sort of pretty, pretty clear which way it fits. So the air filter's back in there now. The cover's on. And then you obviously have to tighten up the clips there, going to the cylinder head cover. And this one, which is like a Jubilee clip. I think that was 10 mil again. Normally they're 7 mil. But I think that was a slightly bigger 10 mil. But like I say, once that's all in place, it's going to be very awkward to fit the air duct in which just sits above the front of the radiator so you really want to fit that first because it's very awkward now to try and squeeze that air duct back in There are now five connectors that we need to connect for the following sensors. The IV tech solenoid valve, two connections. The oil pressure sensor, the VTC oil control solenoid valve and the crankshaft position sensor. So here's two photos just to remind you what those connections look like. And the two for the IV tech. So it is quite awkward to connect these because again you're right at the back of the engine on the left hand side so the two on the IV tech aren't so bad you need to get underneath like I was then for the crankshaft position sensor um, and once you've connected all five you need to reconnect this power steering clip and then just give a check over and make sure you've connected all those sensors Now that awkward auxiliary drive belt. I seem to struggle a lot with this. You need a long 14mm spanner 
and in some ways the engine mount seems to be in the way. It might be tempting to remove the engine mount to give the spanner a longer range of movement on the tensioner or use a bent spanner if you have one. Trust me, it was more painful for me to add this drawing. But anyway, on with the belt. So here we have our auxiliary drive belt, which is a nightmare to fit. Um, my only advice is that maybe use a bent spanner and possibly remove that engine mount to give yourself a wider angle of movement on that tensioner. Now the T-bar that sits across the top of the radiator and supports the bonnet lock and the fan wiring harness. 10mm socket required for these bolts. So here's the T-bar. There is a single bolt at the bottom of that part, like I say in my original video, um, that was missing on my car and it looked like somebody had welded it. So you should have a central bolt at the bottom as well. So this is quite a fiddly job because um, we need to bring those brackets up that support the radiator and then there's a further two bolts on each side of that top bar so here I'm just doing the radiator part a little bit of light oil on never hurts So those are the brackets that sort of hold the radiator and cushion it from shocks. So I'll take the other one off on the other side. I'd pop them back in just so I didn't lose the bolts. Again, I, put, I hadn't put that air... Um, induction pipe in there which again I think was a big mistake so do make sure you try and put that pipe in first because that pipe sits underneath this bar and by the time you've done all this work to fit this T piece in and then you notice that the plastic pipe for the air filter sits underneath that bar and on top of the radiator you realise you've got a bit of a fiddle on your hands to try and retrofit that. So do make sure you fit that first. So these are all 10mm bolts. I'll speed this next part up. So we'll have a bit of high speed here while we put these bolts in. And I think it's at the end of putting all this in that I then realise about that air pipe. So it's all nice and tight and snug. And then we have the two bolts just below this point for that air pipe. But I've just realised it's right down there that it has to go. And that's held on with two bolts. So I take the two bolts out. I get the pipe. And then realise... How am I going to get that back in there now? So as you can see, I think that pipe needs to be fitted before you put that T-bar on and also possibly before you put the air filter box in it itself. So try not to make the same mistake I made. The bonnet lock can now be fitted. 10mm socket required for these bolts. So this is held on with three bolts. And you need a 10mm socket. And don't forget that the cable clips onto the T-bar. 
and you may need to fiddle around with this for a bit because it is adjustable as to how much pull on the bonnet it actually does. Don't forget the earth lead for the injector wiring harness. 10mm socket required for this bolt. So this is quite important. This is the earth lead. So that's a 10mm socket and make sure that's nice and snug. Now for the all important engine oil. Now I think I made a silly mistake here. As I tried to get away with less oil than needed on the bases, I was going to throw it out soon after I knew all was okay. I'm sure it was the low engine oil that gave me a starting problem as the car started the next day when my wife said, don't be tight, put the full amount of oil in. So here I put some cheap oil in, um, and I don't even think it's semi-synthetic. Now I think there might have only been three to four litres in here, but I thought that might be enough just to get the car starting so I knew it would tick over and everything was okay. And when I knew everything was okay, I was going to obviously change the oil and filter. But I think this might have been what gave me a starting problem, because once this was all done, the car would not start until my wife said, put more oil in. And as soon as I actually put more oil in, the engine actually started. So it may be worth putting in, you know, five litres of oil, not three to four. Now the very important coolant. I filled with a 50-50 mix of a quality 5-year OAT antifreeze. You're looking at 5.3 to 7 litres for this. So I did at least use a quality OAT coolant here made by Comma. And the OAT stands for Organic Acid Technology. But basically it means that the cooling system is protected far better especially with aluminium so it's probably well worth the extra bit of money and it does last five years so there will be air locks in here so we will need to try and purge the air out of the system which hopefully will happen once the engine starts now later on I did find out a slight leak from the thermostat pipe going to the radiator and that was due to an old rusty clamp. So in hindsight, it's better to put new Jubilee clips on where you can. Lastly, that earth lead to the battery. 10 millimeter socket for this. So we pop the earth lead back on and I thought all would be well now. Just turn the key and she'd fire. But no, nothing. So I had to go through all the process of checking fuel, whether there was spark. This one had me fox. I assume perhaps the timing was out. It was quite depressing. Everything seemed like it should have worked, so I thought best check the throttle butterfly was opening. I could smell fuel, so I thought best do a check for spark. Videoed this on my iPhone, and spark is fine. I then thought I'd best check the fuel pump relay. Little did I know that even the car wanted the full 5 litres of oil, so it even gave me the money to buy some.
So I removed the passenger glove box compartment so I could check the fuses. And look what I find. Well, thank you. So after a restless night's sleep, trying to think what I'd done wrong, I then gave in to my wife's wishes that we add more engine oil. And it started. So with my wife behind the wheel, with her wishes met of more engine oil, she brought the Honda to life. I quickly ran to open the garage door to let the fumes out. I left the car to run for at least half an hour to get everything warmed up and with a lot of relief she seemed to tick over lovely. It would now be a case of waiting for the local MOT garage to pick the car up and see if it would pass an MOT. So the local MOT station kindly collected the car and off she goes for her test. And the result wasn't too bad at all considering she hadn't been driven for nearly a year. All she needed was a rear drop link for £9.58. The discs were corroded as would be expected from nearly a year, but that would all clean up after some driving. So at this point the Honda's done 200 miles, and here you can see her just gone through the Elam Valley, past the Arch, and on her way to Devil's Bridge. And here you can see the Honda taking a little rest, at the Teffy Pools, near Tregaron. Here are some detailed photographs with labels to help with identifying all the visible parts. I put them on for only four seconds each with the idea that you can pause them for detailed viewing. Thank you for watching and do hope this 10 part series helped in the repair of your Honda.